I have to start with you. Uh, you haven't seen that film since 1968. I haven't is that right? no. seen it. No, uh, it's is it 48 years? It's frightening. Yeah, I'm a relic. Uh, no, I haven't seen it, uh, and I don't. I, strangely enough, I don't remember seeing it. In 1968, I must really? have done. Mm. I remember rehearsing in the days when we did. <laughs> and it shows, my goodness. In a dance hall in Cricklewood that I hated. Uh, John McKenzie was incredible. We were taken to a landfill site for all the bombs and things. Uh, I must have loved doing it. And it's incredible to see it now, mm. to hear me speaking properly, which is strange, <laughs> <laughs> having descended from Thora Heard. <laughs> uh, no, it's amazing. And I think John McKenzie did the most incredible job. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Did, did Noel Coward come and uh, see you? Or, no. Or have any influence on his No, uh, he didn't. Nobody came. Mm. We just seemed to do it in Cricklewood. Yeah. Uh, it is amazing to see it. Yes. It's uh, a wonderful piece. It's an extraordinary piece of work. You must be very proud of it. Yes, I am. Yeah. I'm a little bit not back by it, really. I'm sure. I'm sure. We'll come I back remember to Moira, r the lovely Moira Redman, and Nora Swinburne. Mm. Uh, and for me, I suppose it was kind of posh acting. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it's very interesting seeing that. Uh, and Mariah, obviously, you've done a huge amount of Coward's work. But I think if anybody had come to this, maybe some people have, uh, that, well, you know now, not knowing that it was by Noel Coward, uh, if you watch that not knowing that, what would give it away? I mean, that you, you wouldn't necessarily see that as you do when you're listening to Rachmaninoff on the radio and go, that's by Rachmaninoff. There's nothing in that, is there, you to would, say? You, you would, you know. Really? It's that bishop, and there's uh, confirmation <laughs> in Egham. He always, he always used place names terribly wittily. And there were, actually there are one or two lines in that that are recycled in other plays, e even private lives. So that uh, you, you would know, I think, if you, mm. but only if you were rather embedded in Coward already. I always was kind of persuaded that he had no political agenda, except in this unknown play, which nobody had ever seen. And then the rather smoothy cavalcade, which was a sort of patriotic thing, mm. which was you know, much more kind of smoothly and lavishly expressed. That's terribly upsetting mm. and, and raw. And it's a young man's work, and it's fantastic, I think. Mm. But it is, as you say, there are little hints, perhaps, for the cognoscenti, yeah. but it's a radical departure. And Penelope, you know, in 1930, when this was written, uh, I think one year later, 1931, was the premiere of, uh, in London, of yes. uh, Private Lives, which, which yes. you started, and we'll see a clip from that later on. Can you see any similarities at all between the two? As Mariah says, um, there's just various phrases where you think that is coward talking. But then <coughs> that's how a lot of people spoke in the 20s, with whom coward would have, you know, who we would have met. Uh, no, but that's the fascinating thing about the um, man, isn't it? Mm. that he had all these sort of facets to his personality. Mm. We just think of him as a sort of high comedic writer, I suppose, but there's an awful lot more there. Well, this really is, it's an angry young man play, John, and, uh, you know, it's ironic to think that John Osborne in 1956 wrote angry, you know, he was the angry young man of that time, look back in anger, and ironically knocked Coward's plays into touch, really, because people then thought that his plays were very mm. safe. But here was an angry young man play 26 years before John Osborne wrote, yeah. wrote his iconic what piece. What I find absolutely extraordinary is that, unless I'm very wrong, I mean, he, he came through what he's saying in this play, thinking as he did in this play, to a much more conventional, patriotic, loving England, loving royalty, all that. And I think that's that. I, I sat here thinking, I can't believe I, I can't believe this is coward. I mean, I know it is, and and there are, as you say, there are traces of it all over the place. But what a journey! Mm. I mean, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. This is this is revolutionary stuff, mm. and it, uh, the, the later stuff is is all. But well, ca I'm particularly cavalcade, of course. But yeah. mm. I mean, but isn't it a sort of trope that we go from left to right as yes. we get older? Mm. Uh, and, yes, and he did. 
But do you think yeah. that's one of the reasons why he, he said, I think it was fit for, pro, uh, for production. No, fit for publication, but not for production. Yeah. So he obviously want, he wanted to write it and then sat on it. But probably, did he lose his nerve a bit, do you think? No, I think probably the theatrical man in him knew that it would be very difficult to stage. Yeah. Um, that it works so well on television. We totally accept that here is uh, a, a dead man when you see it like that. But I think it would have been very, very difficult on the stage. I mean, mm. the way he did it in, yeah. you know, uh, our Carty. Blight yes, Spirit. Blight yes. Spirit. Yeah. Um, Elvira is by painting her grey. Yes. Yeah. But you couldn't paint you grey on the stage. No. Yes. I remember reading, uh, whether I saw, uh, read uh, the original version, I don't know. The thing that amazed me, having uh, sort of done uh, Bly Spirit in rep, and I mean, I just think he was the most marvellous writer to, to read a page of coward comedy is like the most wonderful machine. And I remember reading for this, post, and this is one of my, the highlights of what I remember. And it's not in the play, but strangely enough, his writing, it was like a Z car script. When they were in the trench, they were talking about, no, that's not my mug, it's your mug and thing. Which I remember it did surprise me. Uh, and then obviously I got on with it, shouted by John McKenzie. It was interesting. <laughs> but it's a very well-made film too, John, isn't it, in, in terms of its direction and the way it's put it's together, the, the mean, montage. It's, it's, a t it's an incredible irony that uh, this play, as we've just seen, uh, post-mortem, probably works better on film than mm, it yeah. does on the stage, sure, whereas almost yeah. every other play he wrote, of course, works better on the yeah. stage than it does yes. on film. Yes. So that... Uh, I think that was absolutely right. I mean, I think it would have been very difficult to stage, and I think he knew that probably, mm. and thought, well, no, maybe not. But mm. uh, they were making films in those days. Perhaps he should have given yeah. it to a young Richard Attenborough or something like that. Yes, and it is an adaptation, of course. I, mean, I it's did. A cut -down version. I had a look at uh, Noel Carr's diaries this morning. It's a rather interesting thing here about because uh, it wasn't done in the theatre, and, it, and it was no kind of success. And he was depressed about Peace in Our Time, which he wrote after this, uh, which hadn't gone very well. And he said, if it's a failure, I think England is a very silly island indeed. In spite of Clive and Drake and Trafalgar and Shakespeare and Alwyn, Clemens Dane's companion. <laughs> and I think that's perfect, don't you? I think it's very funny. In brackets. Yeah. <laughs> but the construction of the players, well, Mariah, it, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it, to think that I, I, when I saw it the other day on a, on a preview copy, um, I was surprised and, and the, the, the idea of travelling in time, and I thought, well, this must be post-Priestley. He must have maybe had that idea from Priestley's time in the Conways or something, or It's a Wonderful Life. And I checked those, of course, and It's a Wonderful Life is 1946, as I'm sure you all know. Time in the Conways is 1937, so that mm. was seven years after. So apart in my vague head, H.G. Uh, Wells' yeah. Time Machine, which is 1895. This was a relatively new idea, wasn't it? I mean, we can look at Dickens' it's, Christmas it's, Carol, it's, but... It seems radical in very many ways, but I think what, what I found so fascinating was that it's... I, I riffed through the play this morning, mm. and it's very blousy. I mean, it's tremendously overwritten. Right. And this has been done such a service simply by very scrupulous and clever cutting, I think, mm. and probably a, a little adjustment... Uh, not much. I mean, I, the, the opening is at almost verbatim uh, mm -hmm. from the original play, but the but you know the way the sequences dissolve into one another is obviously far more filmic than mm. it could ever be in mm. a stage. And I think the kind of he, he didn't write it for these actors, and usually he wrote plays knowing who was going to play mm. them, mm. which took an enormous burden of responsibility from him for sort of what lies underneath. I mean, he knew what Gertie would bring. So he, he didn't put that in. He knew that when she spoke those lines, uh, that those, her own qualities would enrich it in a particular way. This seems to me to be much more like the, the kind of risk that an ordinary playwright takes who doesn't have his cast up his sleeve. And it worked sublimely with those faces that one has seen mm. all one's life. Mm. You probably yes. haven't. 
Um, well, so good to see it. Colin Jevons. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't it? what a wonderful yeah. actor he was. And Nora Swinburne. Yes. Yes. So beautiful. Yeah. Oh, oh. And Victor Winding. <laughs> yes, yes, Victor too. Yes. Well, all of them. Yes, all of them. Um, Garfield <laughs> Morgan. Yes. Oh. Controversially, well, do you, I mean, you mentioned that the cuts maybe helped it. Mm. Do we think, and I'm saying this with Alan Brodie in the room, so I probably shouldn't, but do we think that uh, some of Coward's other plays might benefit from, <laughs> from a, a slightly different... <laughs> no, <treatment>? Alan. <laughs> I, spend, no. I spend my life on the phone to Alan saying, can I cut this? <laughs> so I, when I, I, I think there are very few that wouldn't respond to trimming. Really? Uh, I did Blythe Spirit with Harold Pinto, a very economical playwright. He directed it. And he refused to cut a single word. And the poor audience in the National sat there for hour upon hour upon hour as we, this thing unfolded. And you, you could, even then, we knew that something judicious would have made a huge difference to it. Mm. But, but uh, they were ironic admirers of each other. I mean, not ironic in their feelings, but it seems like they're odd bedfellows, Pinto and Coward. Well, they really weren't at all. Uh, Perhaps an excess of reverence was all that was wrong really? in, at Harold's end. Yes, yes. Just to say, with post-mortem, surely, I mean, the sheriff play, Journey's yes. End, is so powerful. Mm. I'm sure if you've been in that for any length of time, did he take over from Olivier? Because Olivier played stand-up first, didn't yeah. he? It was a production in Singapore, I oh, think, it was. In, so I don't think... He did it for one, I think, one week. Did he? Uh, somebody yes, right. was sick and he learnt it. Really? Yeah. And really. he went on and John Mills was in the cast. And they were a company called The Quaints, I think, or something like that. Uh, and they were not quite amateur. And he stepped in and saved the day and absolutely had a, you know, had a yes. time of his life. Yes. It yes. brought him back from a ba breakdown. It but is, it is slightly, well, I, I don't know what says, but it's, it's, I mean, they're all there, the, the Journey's End characters. They are, so that's the, what the, I felt. There's Rally, there's yes. the, the bitter yeah. one, I can't remember, uh, Hibbert is his name? Uh, Hibbert, uh, I can't yeah. remember the names. Um, and, and, and Colin they Farrell. They are there, aren't they? Playing, the, the, playing them all. Playing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I find myself thinking, hey, it's a bit of a steal. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I did rather too. Um, but, I mean, none the worse for that. But, uh, it, 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 uh, but the device of taking... Keith's character and taking him into the future, obviously, oh, yes, is something that which takes something it into a different level, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. And I thought better done than, in a way, than the Alvira plot, but it's a, it's a different story, different totally. aim, completely totally. different. Well, that's, totally. that's a different yes. aim, yes. Yes, yes. yes. yes totally. And the politics underneath it, obviously, um, we alluded to Cavalcade, but there aren't many other plays. I mean, I, Marcus mentioned I directed Semi Monde, which is a play that's very rarely done, mm. um, which is a great shame, I think, but it's not done because there are 33 characters in it, and you can't really play 33 actors. I did it at drama school where they all came free, so that's why we did it. <laughs> but if you don't know that play, it's, it, that was written, I think, in 1926. It was one of his first sort of four or five plays, and that is really full of politics, not just the politics of love, which we'll come on to in a minute, which he wrote about so much, but the politics of, of sexuality in that mm -hmm. as well. And I think it was banned at the time, and again, very rarely performed even now, because he was talking about gay bashing in this play, you know, in yes. 1926, which is something we just didn't hear. And he did, wasn't afraid of, uh, well, didn't shy away from issues, did he, in the vortex, which I think yeah. you've, you've been no, as well. No, I, I have done the what, um, Was there a hint of, of, of I a gay so. romance in, in, in the Colin, 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 yes. Colin Jevons? And was that, yeah. was that, was 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 that what that yeah. was about? That's what that was yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think the quote it was, uh, love among men in war is, and there was yes. a wonderful pause before worth remembering. Yeah. Um, which obviously takes you in a different direction and is a different sentiment, but I think the pause says that he was mm. suggesting well, that Well, that's was. absolutely not in Journey's End. Not, not a trace of it in Journey's no. End at all. No. Um, so he was obviously going out on a bit of a limb there. Mm. The only uh, line that made me titter uh, was, of course, the uh, the fact that the phrase tongue sandwich now means something yes. quite different. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she got one. <laughs> <laughs> it was you laughing. That was why I noticed. It was you that was laughing. Yeah. Um, but uh, when he comes back, when you come back as, as John there into that world of the 1920s, obviously, Coward, as a young man, you say our politics change, and they do a little bit uh, as we get older, and maybe we'll see a result of that later on tonight. But... Um, he was aware of the self-obsession of that, of that society, wasn't he, when he comes back in, in the 1920s, the decadence of it all? Yes, I think he was. Um, but I think he was probably... He probably had been a, affected by the horrors of war. He, John, you, or Coward himself? Coward. Coward. Yeah. To, to actually put it down. Mm. Uh, well, we're forgetting in which we serve, too, of course. Yes, which, which, yes. Is, of course. which is another aspect of the car, but that's, in a way, completely the reverse. That's, mm. that's 
uh, Union Gun Jack. Ho, rah, That's rah, the Union Jack, Rah Rah, rah Rue Batania. Yes. Yes. Mm. Um, yes. and, and that is much later, of course, but it, it's, it's extraordinary that I say it's an incredible journey that this has come. Mm. But, when you, but when you think of that, the, the generation that immediately followed the carnage of World War One, it actually threw up this it was a brief subsection of people called Bright Young Things, which is, in a way, what he populates his comedies yes, with. with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were living every day as if it was their last and partying like mad and, you know, flippant and, you know, tossing over old values. The, the, the World War I had an enormous influence, even on the comedies. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a, an, another stage of something which must have marked him and his generation it is. But also in a way, I mean, he's being very critical, John is being very critical in the play of those people and their self-obsession. Uh, we'll come back to self-obsession in a moment. But at the same time, the response to the horror of, of the war, which obviously none of us went through now in, in this room in the First World War, um, that was almost an understandable reaction yes. to it, wasn't it? They'd been deprived oh, so, oh, yes, for so yes, long, yes. they'd seen these horrors. Mm. You know, in Paris we had That's Dadaism right. and Surrealism coming up as a response to the horror of war. So as much as he does criticise them, in a way, could we have expected any other reaction from that generation? Could John have gone back and expected them to all have been talking about the war? No, because you can't, can you? I mean, when he died, he died in that sort of time. That was so clever, mm. I thought. Yes. The way John still had the values. Yes. Mm. I, I really admired the way as well, through the use of the ghost, the fact that there was a, an understanding that, that it was a wonderful vision, and I hope that is in the original play, I'm sure it is, that nobody responded in any way no. saying, what are you? There was a, a sort of dramatically yes. and thematically, we just knew that they were seeing him. Yes. And we asked no more yes. questions. No, it was, it, that, that was interesting, and that yeah. worked so well on film, and I think would have been really difficult in but the theatre. At what point, you see, I have to admit that I didn't at first realise that he oh, was... Oh, John. I didn't. <laughs> I thought, oh, he, he survived. <laughs> <laughs> With a great hole in his stomach. Well, yes, people do. But you I thought mean, he got better. Yes, but the first scene with Norris Swinburne, I thought, oh, he's survived and he's gone to see his mum. Then as it progressed, I thought, oh, no, he hasn't survived, he's a ghost. But it took me some time to get there. The clues um, are there, as they say, but it's very subtle, which is what's so yeah. wonderful about but this. But I this think writing. that generation all saw ghosts. I mean, I think that mm. uh, when he wrote that, there was a generation of people who did yeah. see dead people in their bedrooms. I know my mother did, and I know that was not an uncommon kind of memory. That it's you know, people well, may have hallucinated or whatever, but it's not an uncommon thing that after a, a terrible war, people think that they see. Uh, the victims. Maybe. There was an enormous uh, uh, rise of spiritualism too. Yes. Yes. There, there were spiritualist mm. seances all over the place yes. with, with the people conjuring up. I had an them. auntie. Um, I loved her. And she had two sons. This is absolutely true. Two sons. Uh, and they were both in the Navy. Uh, and she lived in South Yorkshire where I came from. And she was doing the floor in the sitting room. And these two sons came home and just stood while she was on her knees scrubbing the floor with her feet with their feet then the trousers and the uniform and she she looked at them she said oh god thank god i'm psychic <laughs> <laughs> and they were actually there yeah. so, i mean they'd come home they're on leave so i think it is absolutely true lovely dear auntie maggie I I, oh thank god i'm psychic <laughs> I think she put the scrubbing brush in the bucket then. <laughs> One of the impressive and almost depressing things about the film for me, though, is, is that you think this was a forerunner, a precursor of, what, 80 years, 60 years in some cases, of films like Born on the Fourth of July, Jarhead, and The Hurt Locker, you know, where somebody comes back from the war, albeit as a, as a dead yeah, person, yeah. Well, and cannot believe that society doesn't acknowledge how awful the war has been. Yes. 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 Plus a change, in a way, which is, it, it is a little depressing, isn't it, that um, the message with this film, whether it was accept accepted in 1930, which it couldn't have been as a play, or in 1968, has not percolated through, and those films still don't make a difference to the horror of war, which somebody says, oh, no, it's something else. Uh, war is such a terrible, terrible yes. thing to go through, and no mm, one seems yeah. to learn from art or life. No, no, but that, that's, no one that's, ever that's what happens. I mean, yes. at, at the moment, look what's happening in Nepal, and we sit there and we think, this is terrible, what can we do? We can't do much, we think. Shall I give some money to the person who's doing it? <coughs> it, it just doesn't, it never, ever completely gets through. It can't. No. I no. think probably the last few wars, it, it has got through more 
in as much as with the Paralympics and the help for heroes and those terribly brave young men running and walking to the South Pole or North Pole with their artificial yeah. legs. I think we kind of probably acknowledge it more. Mm. But there is still no other answer to so many problems, no, is there? No, really? no, sure. you know, not sure. And the no, man no. In, in this character, I can't remember the name of the character, who says, I would shoot my son if yes. he didn't go. Mm. Tilly. You know, Tilly, thank you. Yes. You, th you think there are probably still fathers who would do that, and what do you do if you don't, yes. if you don't go? I can't imagine myself ever uh, wanting to, to go to war or kill anybody, but what do you do if you, if you don't? How do you defend your country or way of life? Mm. Yeah. And, and, and the, the, the representatives of each sphere, you know, the press baron and the... Yes do-gooding lady with the dead son who didn't like her. Uh, and uh, the, the, Those were terribly well chosen, and I think mm. that that is probably still hard at it too. Certainly the press is. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. yes. That, was yes. The, that was brilliant, the, the, uh, the stuff that... Yeah, uh, that the, um, very quick uh, uh, section. This, where he kept on doing the the, the journalese. Mm. Oh, yeah. oh, uh, really? Garfield. Garfield. Yeah. Garfield. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did yeah. the journalese yes. as, yes. as, as a, I thought that was absolutely that brilliant. Was that's that's a brilliant device, and I mean, that's a real genius. Mm. Being that, a bit um, technical, John, was it a single, was it single camera? What? Was, what? <laughs> the whole thing. Was it shot single was camera? Was it shot on a single camera? You're asking me. Oh, he's only a director. I know. You were no, there. I was gonna, I, no. I, that was my question to you. Oh. Um, Somebody else had that question too. Don't ask it. We don't know. Uh, I, w I would think the answer is probably yes. I really meant a film camera rather than yes. it wasn't multi... Well, this is technical. Multi-camera. No, it's, it's it fascinating like because it the, the, the whole multi-camera... Yeah, you think it'll be single camera? Yes. I, I think so. I think it was There were so many cutaways. But you see, you can't do... I mean, uh, this puts me onto a favourite hobby horse of mine. That, uh, we, we did... Um, private lives. We did private lives <laughs> together. <laughs> and that was multi-camera. And, and I cannot think that it could have been, could have been any other way because no. a play like Private Lives, they have to fly. And if, if Alec yes. and Penny... And uh, Donald and had to do reverse. were flying. It was no good me saying, "Oh, cut, cut! I don't like that shot," because the, you can't yeah. get it up there again. Yeah. So literally, we shot it, multi camera, five cameras, six cameras, um, in whole acts. I mean, we didn't stop. I said to my crew, "Look, if they're up." If they're on fire, we've got to be on fire too, so please try and get the shots right. Um, Sheridan Morley, who is a coward's friend and, and biographer, as I'm sure you all know, said that he, uh, his plays were about the necessity and impossibility of love. I, I love that quote. Do you think that's true, the necessity and impossibility of love? He certainly shows that in, in well, the private Vortex life. and in Private Life. It was it's yeah. wonderful, that, Penny. It was wonderful. It was just terrific. Well, Alec was just extraordinary. But you see, it's extraordinary in that scene that we saw, um, the, and this is a tribute to, to Penny and to Alec, they both, I, I didn't do anything, I just let it happen, um, they both understood that it wasn't all brittle chit-chat, that there came a time in that scene where the brittle chit-chat <coughs> stops, mm. and, and it's done so subtly. Yes, it just yes. subtly. Well, this is you did it. I, <laughs> um, it's done so subtly. It starts with, uh, and, and you can see it just beginning. And then by the by the end, um, oh, it's, the, it's totally the chit chat's gone. It's just two people who love each other, mm. and that's mm. absolute. And I just it's magic writing and, and magic playing. It is magic writing. It's extraordinary. I was doing a play in the theatre when I was asked to do that. And it was, I think, one of the easiest texts I've ever learnt in my life, mm. really. It just, and it's quite a lot to learn. It's quite a lot to learn, but it's like... For what a, reason? Because it just flows It's just so a beautiful yeah. piece, piece of music. You know, the music, it just... Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. isn't it? It, it is. sort of flows. You can't actually it. say anything else. Mm. So often when you pick up a text, you know, you get, oh, but that's a, a but, but it should be an and. But with coward, it's very difficult mm. to say the wrong word. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some actors that understand the language, the language is a sort of decoy sometimes. I mean, those lint white elephants on the, sorry, yeah. on the strength of it are, are a comedy line, but they're not. They're where she starts to be so pierced to the heart. Yes. That, That's and exactly so, what I meant. Yeah. You, you saw it coming yeah. when, when they started talking about lint white elephants the, and the burning yeah. cars yeah. and all that stuff. Which a lot of lesser actresses. Mm. Act, oh, I'm not allowed to say actresses now. Oh, actors. yes, you are. I hate all that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Yeah. Alistair's a chairman. 
<laughs> You're not no, a chair. No, I'm not a chair. No, 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 no. A, a, a lesser actress would have kept it brittle. Uh, no. uh, uh, <coughs> kept it up, up the wit, and because it's so funny, you know, with lint white and lint white. You know, but, yeah. but with Penny, you could see it. You could yeah, see, see it. it. See the, but, but but the thing is, was it Coward who said first of all, just say the words and don't knock the furniture over? And everyone thinks that sort of terribly flip. Yeah. But the thing is, one of the secrets is to say the words. Yeah. yeah. Not impose too much on yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, yes, there's, the, great, there's the greatest film actor ever when asked how, how he did what he did. And he, uh, he, he said, what do you mean? Well, I just learned the lines. Mm. That was Spencer Tracy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, you both talked uh, you know, very warmly about the parts that you played. Do you think he did write specifically well for women more than a lot of other playwrights, particularly male playwrights in the past, have done? He wrote did very he well for himself. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. He, put oh, he, himself wrote, in. he wrote wonderfully for women, but then one of his contemporaries, so did Ratigan. Mm. Because he yeah. understood them, yeah. do you think? Or? He doesn't do gender, yeah. uh, no, really. He doesn't. Uh, I think right. there, there, lots, there are lots of reasons for that. I mean, one was that he was gay at a time when it was prosecutable. You could go to jail. Um, and the other is that he uses, he doesn't do sex. Like, like in, no. w w that's the sexiest speech in one of his plays about blood and sand and things that, that's in the, um, uh, the Design for Living one. Yeah. But he does jealousy instead, which is can be more potent, I suppose, than sex. <coughs> he does it through jealousy. Mm. He does it in private lives through jealousy. He does it in design for living through mm. jealousy. So mm. it's there's tons of passion. But it doesn't really matter who's saying which line, in a way. Mm. I mean, Elliot and Amanda are quite interchangeable, yes, they aren't are. they? Yes, they are. Yeah. Well, I wonder, you, you sort of alluded to it as well, and again, if we're, if we're being slightly critical of the man, dare we, uh, dare I, um, that he does write so well for, for women, could we say that his writing for men perhaps, and I think post-mortem is an exception, perhaps isn't as, isn't as good that, that the characters, the male characters, are either awful bores or are him? Ooh. Is that... Ooh. 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 I don't know. I'm opening up a can of worms. I hope I am. I'm, yes, I'm, you well, are. Yes. <laughs> I, I did Hay Fever uh, years before I did, did Private Lives, and there were some wonderful male characters in that who are very funny. I mean... Mm. Uh, Richard uh, Breton. Uh, we had Richard Briers playing... Um, Sandy. Sandy Tyrrell, and he was hysterically funny. And that's, yeah. there's some very funny stuff in, in Hay Fever for yes. men. No? Yes. Um, and uh, Richard Gretton was Charles Gray. Yeah. Um, uh, Good. Well, I shall, I shall take that idea out of my head completely after that. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I do think he does in uh, Blythe Spirit, he certainly uses Charles as the feed that certainly the women in Blythe Spirit, the mm. Ruth and Elvira, Madame Arcati. Mm. Very much. Yes, I think Take Charles it. Condamine is a hard it road to toe. It's, it's an absolutely... But then Ruth is quite a hard road to Oh, I think that's the most oh, wonderful Oh, it's a wonderful <laughs> part. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Which? Ruth. Oh, yes. yes. No, I think Elvira and, and Madame are the parts. People think Elvira is great fun, and it's a misery wearing all that green and grey stuff all over you. But, but I, I was actually telling them earlier, I got a postcard from Judy Campbell, who was the only one who ever played it with Coward. They did it in the wartime. And um, actually, Coward was appalled to discover he'd written a play about death and was playing it in the, in, during the war. But Judy sent me this postcard. I'd never met her, and I was doing it at the National, and it said, I thought I'd give you the note that Noel Coward gave to me about Elvira. And it's this, never forget that Elvira is a ghost in gumboots. <laughs> Which means that, you know, she may, be, it may look ethereal, but she's uh, quite a tough nut underneath. The thing about, um, our, I played Arcati, Arcati is the best placed role you can ever have. They talk about you an awful lot <laughs> during Act One, and, you, and you float on, and hopefully are funny. And then you have a wee bit in Act Two, and then Act Three she takes over. Yeah. It is wonderfully placed, because it needs a lot of energy, that, that role. Right. Mm. Well, we talked about uh, his wit um, and his attitudes towards love, the impossibility and necessity thereof, but you alluded to it in that scene. It, it, he, in Private Lives, the scene on the balcony and elsewhere in his place, particularly in, it, but, uh, particularly in his songs, I think, having done this show, which uh, Marcus alluded to that I put together myself, uh, of a lot of his songs, the romance, the understanding of romance and the purity and beauty mm. of that romance and sometimes the, the horror of, of love. There's a little quote I have here from uh, Hay Fever. Simon says to Myra at one point, you're everything I want you to be. Marvellous clothes, marvellous looks, marvellous brain. Oh God, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that power of romance, that moment that the spark lights, he observes it so well mm. and so beautifully, doesn't mm. he, with such mm. passion. Yes, yes. yes. And I think people ignore that sometimes. Yes, 
certainly in his songs, don't they? Yes. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's wonderful that having, I mean, I can remember when, if you said, well, we think you're doing coward play, people say, oh, no, don't do coward. Mm. Oh, that's hopeless. Do a kitchen sink. Mm. I mean, when John Osmond, as you think, I think you said, came up, I mean, coward just went. I mean, you, nobody paid any attention at all. Yeah. And I think it was a production that James Bruce Evans yes, did at was. Hampstead with... Ted D'Souza. Ted D'Souza and... Rosemary, oh no, Rosemary, Rosemary Martin. Martin. Rosemary Martin. Um, which <laughs> Our some, minds are still working. <laughs> uh, which suddenly, and yeah. it got very good notice. It was, yeah. it was at the little theatre in Hampstead, and, uh, mm. and it, it got good notice and brought it right back. Yes, that's it was right. an extra, I mean, it was a very simple production, but it was, I had never seen a coward play until I saw that. Really? really? Yeah. 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 His plays, you mentioned you've done them yourselves, are great star vehicles, aren't they? I mean, they were written, for, as you said, for, for Gertrude Lawrence, for himself, for the Lunts, and they continue to attract people to direct them for television, for theatre, and to be in them, presumably because they are great parts and Wonderful. great yeah. vehicles. Yes. Felicity Candler back to open in mm. Hay Fever in the West End. I know she's been on tour with it, but it, that never, that's never going to go away, is it? No, They're great no, star no, no, no. And the good thing is, um, you've played Hay Fever, haven't you? Yes. yes I got I, a lot of postcards on that one, too. You? Everybody said, look out. <laughs> she's much more difficult than she seems yes. to play, and I think yes, she, she is. is. She yes, is. yes, yes. I, <coughs> I, I played her. But they, the good thing is now that actresses, or they would say that when actresses reach a certain age, you know, um, but there, there are wonderful parts in great comedies for actresses to play. There's Judith Bliss, there's R. Carty, there's uh, Lady Bracknell, and all those mm. ones. And, she, and certainly Judith Bliss is in there, mm. and so is R. Carty. Yeah. See, I'm, always, great parts. I'm always yeah. slightly worried, though, when you say uh, older actresses for that, because, because I think sometimes his plays are slightly spoiled by us looking at them as star vehicles yes, for ourselves right. later, because... Um, for example, Fallen Angels, it's the, uh, it's the seven-year itch. Yeah. And it's played by 60-year-old women constantly in America. And, and is the, it? Yeah, and it, the joke is kind of really lessened by that. And I think the gag with Judith Bliss is that she's far too young to retire, but yeah, she keeps retiring. Yeah. She should be in her 40s, yeah. shouldn't she? Yes, well, then you can tell she's been how much she's by the age of the two kids. Yes, <laughs> yes. Simon well, it was Edith, it wasn't it? Edith yeah, Evans yes. who came and, and did it, it rescued it for yes. older yes. ones. Yes. Yes. Yes.